Hi. Thank you very much, Adam. I was like looking forward to some sort of a pun, and you did not disappoint. Um, so I moved the microphone a little bit further away. Is does the sound? Is it okay if I talk from here? Good. Still. Cool. Okay. So hi, I'm Shirley again. Um, it's not. Dang it. Okay. Let me move my notes back over here. And then. All right. So hi again. I'm Shirley. Um, I'm going to talk about Backbone and D3. And I'm super excited to be here. So thank you very much for having me, Backbone Comp. Um, and before I begin, my slides are up online at that link where the bunny is pointing to it. And thanks to the awesomely huge projector, it's about the size of my head. Um, but I encourage you to, if you can get Wi-Fi in this room, to follow along on the web page uh, because I'm going to be blasting through like a lot of code. And um, it doesn't look good on mobile. So I can't get Wi-Fi, but about, <laughs> um, about two years ago, I was tasked to put Backbone and D3 together for work. Um, and when I started looking into how to do this, there wasn't that many resources online. And maybe I wasn't looking at the right places, but after I kind of went through the first process of trying to use them together, I decided to write a blog post. And subsequently, about maybe a year and a half ago, I gave a talk at the Bay Area D3 user group meetup about exactly the topic. And so someone came up to me after and said something that I thought was like the best thing ever. And he said after my like 20 minute talk, you know, maybe I'm missing something, but it really doesn't seem that difficult. And I was like, that's awesome. I totally agree. I think so too. I don't think it's anything difficult to use any two things together or any like set of things together. But what I do think is challenging and very, very interesting is to figure out how to use two things together well. And in the case of Backbone and D3, I think there's two reasons for that. The first being the obvious fact that Backbone, because it's an MVC framework, is object-oriented, whereas D3 is functional. And second, the point that I'm going to be concentrating on today is the fact that both these libraries are very, very opinionated about how the data should be fetched, managed, and rendered and updated. So when I was trying to figure out how to show you this in an example, um, I was like, I don't really want to do the like, you know, to-do app that every, like, every website has these days. And I was thinking about, you know, what do I want to do? So my friends and I like to throw parties once in a while, like house parties. And then I was thinking to myself, what if I can obsessively, crazily kind of just track every person that enters and exits our parties throughout the span of the whole party? Now, I've never actually done this because the overhead cost is quite high. And I don't think this is going to be fun if you're inebriated. Or actually, it might be more fun. But we've never actually tried it. Um, I just thought of it for this talk. But because of that, I've prepared some fake data for you. Um, it's an array of objects where each object is an action um, with the time that the action was taken, um, the name of the partier who's taking the action, and the action itself. And so the action could either be an enter, so they've entered the party, or exited the party. And I made a very simple, very real app visualizing the ebb and flow of our very fake party. So you can see these are buttons um, from 6 p.m. to midnight, because apparently we party from 6 to midnight, which is not true. Um, but it shows that at 6 p.m., I was at the party with Clarice and Catherine. And then at 7 p.m., our friend Alex arrives and then so on, and each blue label represents somebody that has entered. Um, a gray label is somebody that's already been there, or had been there, here. Um, and then a yellow label represents somebody that's going to exit, to leave in the next hour. So apparently Shirley and I, or me, Alex and I, um, 
leave parties really early because we've left at 11. And then at midnight, most people are gone. So here's the code of how I did that with Backbone. It's pretty standard. I created um, a Backbone collection called Party Collection and gave it the URL that this uh, data, party.json, lives in. And then I've created some very simple functions that crunches the data. So um, get all times that gives me back all, you know, all the time values. And get party years at time that if I pass in a time, then it gives me back a list of an array of all the party years, as well as like the attributes of if they've entered or if, they, if they're going to exit. And then the view itself is also very simple. So I've created a party view where on initialization, I'm passed in the collection, the party collection, and it updates. So there's two ways that it updates. It either updates when the collection sends a change or a reset event, or when a user has clicked on that time button and we, we uh, update the selected time and we recalculate and re-render. And the rendering itself is quite simple also. We just um, get the times and party years get the data from the collection, and then we just render the time and render the parties. They're very standard. So if we do the same exact thing um, in D3, so if you plug this code in, it's going to render and do exactly the same things. If we want to do the same things in D3, it looks quite different. So first off, um, to get the data, we use d3.json to fetch it, and it returns us a response of um, all of the, uh, the data as a JavaScript object, um, same functions to crunch the data. But when we want to render an update, that's exactly where it looks different. So D3, the way that D3 thinks about rendering is that um, it comes from the perspective of what data do we have. So we first do a thing called d3.select or d3.select all. We pass in the selector of the things that we want to grab. Um, and I'm not going to get into too much of the detail of how actually D3 works. But um, so that wraps it, that wraps the set of DOM elements in a D3 selection. And we can then pass it the data that we want it to render. So in this case, the data of the array of times and array of party years present at that time. And what the dot data here that, let me try and find it. Oh, what the dot data here does um, is this thing called data binding where it has three primary jobs. Number one, calculate all of the DOM elements that need to be entered um, because it, is, it does not currently exist in the DOM but exists in the data. And number two, calculate everything that should be removed from the DOM selection because it currently exists in the DOM but no longer exists in the data array, so it is now extraneous. And number three, to bind the data in the data array, the first element in the data array with the first element in the DOM selection and so on and so forth. So, when we render, what we want to do is we want to select all the party times, bind the data, and tell it to enter and append um, the divs that make up the party times. And this creates all of the div elements, all the DOM elements that um, shows uh, all the times and party years. And updating then is just taking the enter. So we, we call this the concept of enter update exit. Um, so it adds all of the elements uh, that are new in the data, removes all of the elements that are um, that no longer exist in the new data, and then update because all of the data or all of the DOM selections that currently exist in the DOM and also exist in the data will remain in the DOM and only the attributes will be updated, like maybe the class gets updated or the color, so previously we saw that the color got updated of some of those, uh, those elements. So hopefully I didn't, hopefully that was like a, it was a very fast introduction to D3, but hopefully it was good. 
Um, so before I, want, uh, before I go on, I want to give you some examples of D3. So D3 is, um, stands for data-driven documents, and it's an amazing library that helps kind of um, helps you draw visualizations of data. So the first example I have is the D3 demo reel. And it basically takes the data of the past 10 years of closing stock prices and then kind of um, transitions it along some of the, I guess, most popular charts that D3 can help you draw. And you also see like the beautiful animations and transitions between each of these graphs. So, um, and other than rendering and updating, D3 also provides a lot of sub-libraries um, that help draw, say, like axes that make it very, very easy to draw, say, like axes on a chart or to give you, you know, scale or uh, make it very easy to draw maps. Um, but one of the favorite things that I like about D3 is the layout library that if you just pass in data, it calculates the hex and y positions that the element should be placed upon on the screen. And all you have to do is just render them and position them. Like, don't you don't have to worry about anything. So one of my favorite of those layouts is called the force directed graph. And it just basically, if you pass it an array of nodes and links, it calculates the, um, it uses this kind of force-based simulation between each of the nodes and um, to calculate its position. And it goes through about a couple thousand iterations. You can configure it to arrive at what it thinks might be an optimal uh, positioning of each of the nodes. So this is why I can't refresh it because I don't have internet. But if you re refresh it, you'll see that it kind of like scatters around really crazily before it settles into this optimal state. Um, and that's because it's calculating its positions uh, across all of the different, or across all of the ticks. And this one's just a visualization of um, all the characters from Les Mis, and each link uh, is like a co-occurrence of each character in, or the number of times they each character co-occur with each other in a chapter. So um, the thing I like really a lot about this visualization is that it very easily signifies to you that the most important character in the middle has a, a lot of influence. So this is Valjean in the middle, as opposed to somebody on the side here, if you drag them around, like you can see that they barely make a dent on the, like on the force graph itself. So um, I have a couple more very beautiful um, examples. I don't, I don't think I have enough time to go through each of them. So uh, if you have the time or if you're interested, please take a look. Um, they're absolutely amazing. And one of the things that I like to drill in about D3 is that it's not a charting library. It's not, it's not going to be easy to just like use it and draw like a chart. Like you can't just pass in data and draw a chart or a graph or something. But what it is, is it's a set of tools that make the rendering of a data, like rendering of a data set a lot easier, which I think is beautiful because it gives you a lot, a lot of potential to do really creative things. Um, for example, like I'm just going to go really briefly into it. This, this one over here that you see, um, one of my favorite visualizations. I've never watched Game of Thrones, never read it. Um, but basically, if you look at this, um, each of the nodes, it, it represents a character in Game of Thrones. Um, its size is how many times it's mentioned in that particular chapter. Um, its shading is from light to dark how dead they are. And <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Um, and if you can see these, um, if you can see these little links, um, that's a kill. That represents that somebody has killed somebody in that chapter. So a red is a fresh kill, and a gray is a past kill. And then, and then you can transition. So then it takes you through like an animation throughout all the different books and chapters that he had access to, and it, it, it animates it out for you. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Please check it out. So after that rant, um, I want to come back and say, 
Um, what I was previously saying about Backbone and D3, they do, they do, they try to do very similar things, but in, uh, but with very different approaches. And I think it comes down to the fact that they have very different motivations. With Backbone, the motivation, from what I understand, is to make writing a complex web, web application as simple and elegant as possible. So things like having user input affect the data that's, um, or it, even in fact encouraging the fact that user input affects the data being displayed on the page. Being able to persist that data across different sessions. Whereas D3 is all about rendering data, visualizing data, making it easy to do so, and making it easy to transition between different states of that data. And it's not as concerned about giving you a framework for if a user input does affect the data that's being displayed, it doesn't give you anything for that. So to me, using Backbone and D3 together is all about if I, have a com if I want to be writing a complex web application that where user input can greatly change the data being displayed and visualized. So my first attempt was the attempt about two years ago where um, I didn't know where to begin, so I was like, let's just mash them together. Let's just put D3 right into Backbone and see what happens. Um, and to show you, oh, I forgot to introduce this earlier. So I very excitedly did this thing where I call it concise mode, because um, you can see that the code is really long. It's about like 250 lines. So I go concise mode, and then, and, then, and then just the very important parts appear. So I'll go through that in a bit. Um, I was just really excited. Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, so uh, here's a, an update to uh, my previous uh, very simple app uh, example. So you can see I'm no longer just loading in some data. I, um, I've ex expanded it so that you can um, create the data yourself, reset it, etc. And then Another thing on the visualization side, um, the concept of adding another action. So no, no longer is it just entering and exiting, but perhaps one partier could be talking to another partier, and we draw a link between them. So maybe, maybe I enter at 6, and then somebody else enters at that time. And we're like, and Clarice is like, yeah, I'm gonna talk to Shirley because there is nobody else here. And I submit, and ta-da! And then um, there's absolutely no validation code in this, so um, if you play with it, please be careful because you, you can very um, easily break it by like entering people that don't exist or something. So maybe then they're like, oh, I wanna talk to Shirley too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm popular in this world. Um, sorry, <laughs> I do what I can. Um, so the code itself <laughs> remains very similar, <laughs> except now I'm fetching from localhost. I also have functions to help save and reset. Um, and the only other change is that instead of getting the party years at a certain time, I get the graph at that the graph at the time. So I calculate the nodes and links and pass it back. Um, I don't know why I called it app view starting from here, but I totally mean party view. But that also, that code itself looks very similar. And the only thing that has changed is, um, I think, event handlers for if a user has, you know, input something or submitted something or reset something. So the only big change is that I've now created a separate view called graph view. Um, and I passed it in the, um, the, SVG element whose class name is graph, and also pass it in the same party collection. In the graph view itself, um, the same. Uh, uh, so, so this is this is the D3 force layout um, that I'm creating and passing in some configuration, and then same thing, just on on change, on reset, or add or any of those events on the collection, just re-render for update. And then um, majority of the, it, you, you can, like, it literally is just that 
I took the D3 code over here and jammed it into, say, the backbone render, the backbone views render function. And so this first attempt, it went by pretty well, actually. It, it, um, it made sense to me as a first attempt. And um, other than two huge roadblocks I had, which um, will just lead me down to a huge rant. So I've, I've written down like a very detailed blog post. This is the blog post I mentioned earlier about all the roadblocks I went, like I got into. And you can read about it in here, and I won't say anything because it would be a long rant. But other than that, it worked really, really well. <laughs> oh, like after I figured out those roadblocks, it worked really well. Um, <laughs> so right after I wrote about that blog post, the Bay Area D3 user group, then um, like the next day, they had a meetup on how to use D3 together with other M or with MVC frameworks. And I went and I was like, where were you about four months ago? But um, one of the key things that I came out with it is the concept of a reusable chart. So if you've noticed in my first example of the D3 code, you might have noticed that there's a lot of repeat code, um, especially with the fact that when we render, when we enter something, and then when we update and use enter update exit, we pretty much have like 80% of the code um, written and it kind of just gets reused. So uh, Mike Bostock, the creator of D3, introduced this concept called, called reusable chart where basically we just wrap whatever code that needs to be repeated that will be called many times into a function and then um, pass it in some configurations and now we can just use it anywhere from any different places, any number of times. And you just need to call it. And it's pretty like, yeah, duh. OK. Thank you. Um, but it was a really nice and good and inspirational um, uh, realization. And so same example, um, oh, in concise mode. Um, so the collection stays, the collection code stays very much the same from the first example, but the, uh, but the biggest difference comes in the fact that now instead of a graph view, I'm creating a, a reusable chart that I've called graph visualization. And I'm passing in some configurations like width and height, and then I'm initializing the graph visualization with the D3 selection for the SVG. So this, this dot graph, this line grabs the SVG element and I'm just passing it into when I'm initializing it. So then I'm still updating whenever the collection has, um, has updated or triggered an, uh, like a reset or add event. But this time around, um, what I'm doing instead of just re-rendering everything, I'm um, crunching the data. And I just say to the graph visualization chart, hey, here's the new updated data. Now update. And on the other hand, with the graph visualization, we first have just like a set of the default data. Um, and then here's, here's the code of what I've done in initialization. So um, just setting the uh, configurations on the force layout, et cetera. And then the interesting thing happens in this um, update code where you know, I call update node and I call update link and it goes through the enter update exit pattern and then, and then updates the chart. So, yeah. So, um, the thing that I really loved about this concept was now my um, backbone code and my D3 code was decoupled. So if, say, tomorrow I decide I want out with D3, or tomorrow I say I want out with backbone, I can just switch any of those like two things in or out very easily without affecting the other too much. And the other thing um, I think Oh, actually, that's that's a little bit later. Um, so 
This is where I think I spent a lot of time exploring with side projects of how I wanted to do these things together, to use these things together. So the first example um, I had was uh, last year, um, there was a BART strike, the uh, subway strike in the Bay Area in last summer and last fall, and the same uh, meetup group, the D3 meetup group, decided to host a hackathon. And the thing that I did with it is this thing where it takes like three different elements and displays it on this chart, and then anything that the user clicks will change the data that's displayed in that chart. So, so I used the backbone model religiously, triggered change events anytime, like religiously, um, backbone view, and also this was, for example, the visualization, the code for the visualization um, for that chart. And um, it's really ugly. Like, it's really ugly. It's about 364 lines of ugliness. So then I kept on being like, there's, you know, there's ways to make this better. So then, um, and, and please don't think I'm just working on this all day. This is side projects that I've been doing for fun. Um, so then um, eventually I arrived at this. This was, uh, I think, a couple months ago where um, I was interested in, this is GitHub data, so you can input um, any GitHub user. It pulls their top repos and the contributors of those top repos and their repos, um, and then it looks at their commit history and kind of maps the relation, like maps the timeline and relationships between them. So this actually, this one, this example um, was very light on Backbone because m all of the data crunching was happening on the back end, and um, I didn't really need much of a like Backbone model to support that. And so I was using Backbone as kind of like a translation layer. So translating the data that was coming back into something that D3 could use and visualize. And so the way that I started thinking about D3 and Backbone together at this point was that um, I'm, using, I'm using Backbone for or the model um, for fetching and managing the data. I'm using a backbone view kind of as just the glue between the D3 reusable chart and the model where it just translates things back and forth. And that worked really, really well. And I loved it. And until I started working at, um, I, and I started working at this company called Lumio, um, and we do cloud security. It's really cool if you want to check it out. Um, but when I first started there, I was tasked to help out with a project called Illumination, where we wanted to visualize the traffic, so you can't see much, but, uh-oh. So this is a screenshot of dummy data from Illumination, where each of these little nodes represents a workload. Each of these links is um, traffic between these workloads, and they're grouped together into these bubbles. Um, by either the metadata on them, so labels, app, like the applications that they're in or environment that they're in, et cetera, or by the traffic that they share between them. And if a user um, agrees with the grouping, they'll actually, they'll create what we call an app container, persist it to the back end, and then they can operate on them and create their security policies. And meanwhile, we've also, like, we also provided them with a lot of filters to kind of change the view and um, figure out what they, like, figure out what they want to see in the environment. But as you can imagine, because of all of these things, um, it was, the view was just updating consistently. There were, um, there were things coming in, coming out. There were things you can drag things into and out of bubbles, and they would change the labels. Um, and there started to be a lot of bugs. So we implemented this in the approach number two that I just outlined. And um, there started to be a lot of bugs. And we started to realize that it's because um, D3 assumes um, something very important, which is that when you update between different sets of data, it assumes that um, the data itself 
don't necessarily have to live in the same place in memory. Um, and so the way that it calculates the enter and the exit, so it calculates those um, is by either the index of the data or a key that you specify. So in this case, for these bubbles, we, speci we specified that the key was its name. So it's kind of, um, we concatenated all the labels together and called it the name. But this started to be problematic because people can rename the name. Like, people can change the different labels and change what the name is. So, so then the keys were changing, and that was causing a lot of bugs for us. So at that point, probably most sane and far smarter people would have probably just said, OK, we'll just give a unique identifier for each of those bubbles and you know um and then and then go from there and then um and then everything will be fine but i was like i've been thinking about something for a while and i kind of want to try and see if it works out so let's give it let's give it a try um and it was the thought process that when D3 calculates enter and exit. So when D3 calculates those um, datas, um, that's actually very similar to if I had taken an array of data and then told a backbone collection to say set. So we do backbone or we do collection dot set new data. And that set method actually returns us and triggers an event for all of the models that have been added, all of the models that have been removed, and all of the models that have been merged together and that and thus the attributes have changed. So that's exactly like the enter update exit pattern. And I was like, well, maybe we should take advantage of that because for our specific example, we had backbone models that you know, weren't changing at all. They were the same throughout all the different updates and we just want to be visualizing that throughout all the different updates. Um, it seemed like a really good idea in theory. Um, but in execution, it was just horrible. Um, to the point that I was kind of debating me, like whether or not I should show you because it was just that horrible and that ugly. Um, but then I was like, well, maybe somebody will be able to see it and be like, Shirley, you totally did it wrong. You could have just done it this way and it would have been so much better. Or, just, or, or validate the fact that it was horrible and I should never do it again. Um, so, concise mood. So party collections stayed the same, but now I've created a graph collection that um, listens to any changes on the party collection and um, calculates the graph, and calculates the nodes and the links on the graph, and then um, sets them every time that there is a change. So this will trigger the add, remove, and change events. On the app view side, um, same graph visualization uh, chart, but now I'm not only listening to change events on the collection, the party collection, now I'm listening to add events on the graph, uh, graph collection and then, um, and then calling add to graph on the app view or on remove events and calling remove from graph. So this is still within the backbone model, I mean backbone view, and add to graph just says go through all the models that have been added and um, call add node on the, the D3 chart. And then for each of those models, also, also listen to change events and update node on them. And same thing on remove, we just um, go through all of them, call remove node on the reusable chart. And then on graph visualization, the code is still, we've just broken them apart, we've broken the, um, enter and update and exit code apart from each other, but they're still vastly the same. And this worked fine too. Like this worked, this worked fine. Um, but the thing that made it so ugly was the fact that there was just so many, now there were so many events being fired from all of these different places that just kind of became a very, very um, ugly, a ball of mess. So um, it's now noon. Um, 
give me about five more minutes and then we can go have lunch. But um, so when we started realizing this problem, it was so bad that our new grad joined and she was like, hey, Shirley, I have this bug and it's because of this event, but I have no idea where this event is coming from. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I should have just tried just updating those unique IDs, but I'm so sorry. And eventually, um, what we decided to do was um, back in August when I was applying for this uh, for this talk, um, we were using Backbone with D3 together, and um, but we were starting to talk about how we can refactor the code and what we should be using. And we were thinking, hey, should we stay with Backbone, or should we consider this new thing that people keep talking about called React? You know, some little like company made it. Um, maybe we should try that. And um, I have to say that we moved to React, um, <laughs> um, which is kind of embarrassing to, well, it's not that embarrassing to me. I've, 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 we've been loving it, and it actually solves um, two very important problems for us. The first one being the problem I just mentioned, the very tangled mess of, um, of events that were being triggered left and right by that approach number three that I took. Um, because we use their, um, their, they have this idea called flux, and we use their kind of uh, single flow of data. And it's been great for us because we can track where each event is coming from. And number two, also important to us, is the fact that with D3, we manage the entering and exiting, and we have to make sure that that's being done right. And it's great because it gives us a lot of control. But as our app gets more and more complex, it just, it, it's hard to mentally keep track of everything that is going on. And we, with React, they do exactly the same, the same thing, calculating, entering what's, what should be entered and exited and updated with their virtual DOM. And they unit test the shit out of it so we don't have to. And it just seemed like such a no-brainer because um, John Paul said something yesterday about if somebody has built something great, why not just leverage off of them and make our lives easier? So. That's the end of my talk, um, where I go from backbone and tell you I went to React. Um, but uh, it's been a very, very interesting and great ride. It's been like an amazing community to be a part of. And I just want to thank you very much for having me here and very much for actually listening to what I have to say. And um, if you have any comments um, or, you know, like you have a bug here or you did something stupid there, um, please let me know either by Twitter or over lunch or something. And hopefully I can talk to you over lunch. <laughs> thank you very much.